I'm going to call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have everyone present tonight. Thank you. We're going to start with our guest speaker. John Holcomer is here from um, the Wisconsin Counties Association. He's going to come forward and uh, give a short presentation on WCA. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? All right, well, first of all, I want to apologize. I am not Kyle Christensen. Uh, Kyle Christensen is our uh, government affairs director. Um, I had been in that position for a couple years, but in that position, uh, I decided that one of the conditions that I had when I talked to Mark O'Connell about becoming the legislative director was that I wanted to spend more time in the counties. Um, so many, as I mentioned to your legislative committee earlier this evening, um, Many of, of our county elected officials and county staff throughout the state, uh, they really don't know what WCA is, what we do for them, who we work for, and we really, we work for you. Uh, we are very pleased that we have all 72 counties that are members, dues-paying members of our association. Uh, the dues make up about 14% of our total budget. Uh, we, we do the corporate management for three of our insurance companies. That's where we get a significant amount of revenue from. Uh, we also uh, have a for-profit arm, it's called WCA Services, Inc., and uh, called Wakesi. And uh, Wakesi works with not only county government, but with uh, city government, village government, town government, uh, the tech colleges, school districts, extensively throughout the state. And uh, as I mentioned to the committee earlier this evening, the other statewide associations don't have the resources that we have, so as long as we're not competing with something that they do, they welcome us to work with their employees as well. So as soon as I started doing the outreach, we heard from our members that they wanted more outreach. So about two and a half years ago, they moved me full time into outreach. But again, as I, I mentioned earlier in the meeting this evening, uh, one of the first counties that I visited when I took over as legislative director was Kenosha County. And I remember after the meeting that evening, one of, the, uh, one of the county board supervisors said to me, we had not seen anyone from WCA at a board meeting in 20 years. And I said, we need to change that. Um, we will be here as often as you want us to be here, whether it's for a board meeting or a committee meeting or just meeting with one person if that's necessary. So we're always willing. We work for you. Uh, we do not charge for any of the services that we provide. Uh, including the research and lobbying activities and, and ongoing training. A lot of what I do is uh, I do presentations on roles and responsibilities, ethics and conflicts of interest, county budgeting, uh, the value in the process of strategic planning, parliamentary procedure, um, all those types of things we, uh, we work on. And again, we don't charge for any of those services. So a little uh, background on our association. The Counties Association was formed in 1935, and basically the legislature said that uh, because county government was part-time in our counties, that they wanted a statewide association that would represent those part-time elected officials. So when we were created, we were called the Wisconsin County Boards Association, but we work not only for the boards, we work for county staff as well. So uh, years later, we changed the name to the Wisconsin Counties Association. We have, it's either 19 or 18 or 19 employees. 
Uh, we are all based out of Madison, with the exception of we have the former county board chair from uh, Marathon County. He operates out of his home. He's our eyes and ears in northern Wisconsin. Um, not that we don't get there, but he can get there easier and more frequently than the rest of us can. Uh, we also have the former county board chair from Oneida County, lives in the town of Manaqua, and he does a lot of our work around the state, not only in northern Wisconsin, but around the state on uh, economic development type issues. Our number one priority as, a, as an association is to provide lobby and research for county government, and we do that for all 72 counties. Uh, we try and take a look at things that are, have an impact on a statewide basis. So again, we remind ourselves very, very often that our primary responsibility is the lobbying and research for the counties. Um, part of the outreach that I do is I, I get involved with legislative updates from time to time, um, but, but again, I do a lot of training. And then we have the for-profit arm, and we have a lot of other things that we're involved in, and we meet with you, know, you can just about imagine how many county, you know, county organizations there are out there for all the constitutional officers, for the highway departments, for the code administrators, for the planners, you go down the list, they all have um, you know, statewide training and, and we go to those meetings as well. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit, well, let me first say that, thank you again for having us here. Uh, a lot of times my colleagues will say, well, why are you going back to that county? You know, haven't you been to them before? And I remind them that our elected officials, uh, you serve two-year terms, and there's continued turnover. So the education process is a continuing process. So we average typically in the neighborhood of 20% turnover in county board supervisors in every election. This year we had a little over 21% turnover statewide. Uh, I think you had uh, 18, not quite 19 percent turnover here, five of 23. So we continue to go back into the counties and continue to do that training and provide legislative update. Um, another little background and an interesting tidbit was um, I got elected when I was 27 years old uh, to the Manitowoc well County Board. Served four terms there, including my last term, I was county board chair. Those eight years when I was on the board, I always heard, why is Manitowoc County a dues-paying member of the association? What do they do for us? And there were some complaints. They were hearing from legislators that uh, WC didn't stop in their offices. And it wasn't the truth, it was a rumor, and, and I would talk to those legislators, but that's what was getting back to uh, the rest of the county board members. And they talked about not paying dues, and I said that I believed that the best way to find out what the value of the association is, is to get more involved in the association. You may want to run for the WCA Board of Directors. You may want to participate in our steering committees. You may want to go to the annual conference. You may want to invite us to come in and present to you, um, and we're more than willing to do that. So I think becoming more and more involved in the association um, will show you what the, what the value is. And our total, like I said before, our total revenue from dues uh, is about $640,000, $645,000. Milwaukee, Milwaukee County pays the most at 44000 a year. Uh, we have not raised dues since 2001, and we have no intentions of ever raising the dues again to county government. So we are always looking for other ways to um, enhance our revenue. I do want to open up for questions, but I don't want to take too much of your time. So just a couple things that I'm going to touch upon that I did with the legislative uh, committee uh, earlier this evening. Uh, some of the things that we think will happen after the election, and let me just say that because the majorities are so wide on the Republican side, um, we believe that it's very likely that the Democrats will pick up one or two seats in the state Senate. If that were the case, the Republicans would still have the majority. In the state assembly, uh, the majority that the Republicans currently hold there is the most significant spread in the majority since 1957. We don't believe that there's any way that the Republicans will lose the majority in the state assembly. So what do we think, uh, with Governor Walker not up for re-election this time, what do we think uh, will be some of the things that the state will propose in the next election? Uh, they will continue to talk about reform, and we don't really know exactly what reform means, and I'm not sure if they really know what reform means. But when we asked the question two years ago when we kept hearing reform, um, it sounded like they were more interested in reforming what they do in state government rather than um, 
imposing new things on us. So we'll see if that's the case. Uh, transportation funding probably remains to be the 800 pound gorilla. Um, we continue to push for um, new money, additional resources in the area of transportation, whether that be an increase in the, in the gasoline tax, go back to indexing, to uh, I mentioned toll roads e uh, earlier this evening. Toll roads, would, uh, that would take federal approval. That's a much longer process. But we are open, WCA is open and our membership is open to increases in new fees and revenues when it comes to transportation because we understand the importance of transportation. That's not only the roads and the bridges, it's the harbors, it's, you know, it's the, the airports, it's the elderly and uh, uh, disabled transportation and mass transit. So uh, we continue to work on that. One of the things that we're doing, and it should be uh, no surprise to anyone because we've been talking to our membership as well as the League of Municipalities and the Towns Association, in late September, uh, we are attempting to have a town hall meeting in all 72 counties at the same time, talking about transportation issues, transportation concerns, uh, potential um, revenue sources and so forth. We're looking at each one of the county highway departments um, hosting that type of a meeting, uh, gathering the information and that we have more documentation uh, that we can bring back to the legislature talking about the importance of getting additional money in transportation. Because uh, when we talk about economic development uh, with the private sector, usually the first topic that comes up with them is uh, the infrastructure. And if you don't have an appropriate uh, infrastructure, a strong infrastructure, uh, they're gonna look elsewhere. We also uh, believe that they'll be taking a look at a little bit more tax reduction. Uh, certainly we know that uh, they're always talking about trying to reduce not only the income tax but other taxes as well. One of the things that uh, we fought back on uh, in the last budget cycle was some reform in the area of family care and we were successful in doing that and recently the, the department actually withdrew their waiver application from the federal government to changes on family care but we believe it's highly likely that they will be looking at additional changes coming up in the next budget cycle, and we will stay on top of that. Uh, that along with, we uh, anticipate a very limited revenue growth for the state of Wisconsin, uh, because we're not seeing the job growth, and you know things are picking up in certain part of the states, but when you look at what's going on statewide, um, it's still not where it needs to be. Um, we certainly, we are dealing with an aging population, increasing costs in the area of Medicaid, and we really have no option other than to fund that. So that can easily go up several hundred million dollars in a two year budget cycle. And again, the state has no option but to pay that. And then, you know, we're, we're also saying that, uh, you know, it, it, it's starting to look like the governor is shifting to the reelection mode, and we'll see whether he does run for reelection or not, but that's, at this point, it's, it's, it's likely that he will do that. I wanted to talk a little bit about WCA and, and what our priorities are. Um, I've mentioned before that when the Towns Association and the League of Municipalities, uh, and I'm also a member of the League, I'm the, the mayor in the city of Verona, uh, when the League and the Towns go in and they talk about their legislative priorities, for the Towns it's pretty simple. Usually they're looking at more road aids and they're looking at ways to fend off annexations by cities and villages. The League has a few more issues, but with WCA we do so many different things on a daily basis that we have a lot of priorities. But we try and limit those so that when we go into the legislature and to the agencies and to the governor's office, that we can say these are our top 10 priorities for this budget cycle. That doesn't mean that we won't lobby on other issues, um, but we, we make it known what our priorities are. And certainly, we're gonna ask for additional money when it comes to transportation funding. Uh, we can go back, it's not only in the last budget cycle or the last two budget cycles, we can go back 25 years and we can take a look on a percentage-wide basis what county what counties were getting from the state for transportation and that percentage continues to decline and decline and decline. And most legislators um, really have no idea that the county, we're the only state in the country where the counties provide the maintenance and the snow removal on the state and federal highway system. So a couple years ago, as an example, when we lobbied 
to get a, an additional $55 million in road maintenance money from the state. Uh, as we walked around the Capitol, they said, well, you must be pretty happy you got $55 million. And then we had explained to them that that $55 million that they just voted on and, and passed was $55 million that they're giving us to do their work. They didn't even realize what they were voting on at the time. So uh, again, we're the only we're the only state in the country where the counties do the maintenance and the snow removal. We also believe that the, the issue of 17-year-old juvenile offenders will come back up. We're currently, uh, when there's certain severe crimes that 17-year-olds commit, they get put in the state uh, prison system. As a policy, we agree that, uh, that most 17-year-olds um, most of them, and there, there are some that may need to be locked up, but in most cases, that 17-year-olds would be better served if there was something that was done locally uh, within the county with some, what, some early intervention and other programs rather than the, the state system. Um, that's our policy position, but when we lobby the legislature, we go in and tell them that if they want to move the 17-year-olds from the state system to the local system, then they need to give us the money to do that. It's about $10 million alone just for Milwaukee County if all the 17-year-olds came back out of, their, out of the state system and into the uh, Milwaukee County system. So it's a major issue regarding funding. Um, and then the last one I really wanted to talk about was uh, 911 funding. There are some new mandates that are coming down from the federal government. There's antiquated systems that are out there for 911 that uh, we're hearing different things. Some of them need to be replaced. Some are saying that they need to be replaced by 2020. The old copper system will no longer be um, usable. Uh, I heard from one of the telecommunication folks today that they said that mandate is, mandate is actually 2017. So we're working on uh, to find out what the, what the true date is on that. And with that, I would be more than happy to answer any chairs. I don't want to, I know you've got a lot on your agenda, but uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. If there are no questions, See no questions, we are more than happy to come back anytime. Um, we appreciate, you know, I go back to the, what I heard before about the WC hadn't been here for 20 years. We don't ever want that to happen again. And you have my word as long as I'm with WC that we will be here whenever you ask us to be here. We appreciate the relationship that we have with the board. We appreciate the relationship that we have with the county executive and the staff. And uh, thank you very much for having us. Thank you, John. At this time, I'll open it up to citizen comments. If there are any citizens that would like to speak, please state your name and address for the record. You will have five minutes to speak. Jack Rose, 4315 68th Street. Chairwoman Bruning, members of the County Board of Supervisors, I'm with you this evening just to bring a little bit of an update on uh, what's going on here in Kenosha County with respect to uh, mental health and the treatment thereof. I would also like to address uh, your uh, supervisor, uh, Terry Rose's uh, Resolution 15 on prescribing a psychologist. And I know that this has moved uh, quickly through finance and through human services, and I think everybody should vote their conscience. But I think you should also be aware that, for various reasons, that uh, National Alliance on Mental Illness uh, does not support prescribing psychologists, nor does Mental Health America. And the major reason is that to prescribe psychotropic meds, there's a great deal of uh, importance in the medicine and becoming a doctor, a medical doctor. And so an alternative to the prescribing psychologist would be an effort to pursue advanced practice nurse practitioners. The nurse practitioner has the medical background and if you pair a nurse practitioner with a psychiatrist, there you have a, a team that can get this done. 
because with the nurse practitioner under a psychiatrist, that nurse practitioner can prescribe. We have an example of that right here in Kenosha that's worked very effective. And here just recently, we've got our second psychiatrist that works with the Kenosha Human Development Services. I believe it's Dr. Conrad started this month. And so now it would be great if we could bring in another nurse practitioner. And as you build these teams, they are very, very effective. I would also like to mention in Resolution 15 and the comment about in 2015 the uh, cost for the uh, Winnebago Mental Health Institute uh, has jumped dramatically. In my opinion, part of that cause has been St. Luke's Hospital cutting their psychiatric beds in half. It went from like 41 to 25. So now if you have a person that say has to be chaptered, that person will go to Winnebago if the remaining beds at uh, St. Luke's are filled. And we're finding that case more and more often. And so that not only increases the cost per day for the patient at the, the Mental Health Institute, but uh, I believe this past year, the Kenosha Police Department has spent close to $100,000 transporting the folks going back and forth to uh, Winnebago. And the Sheriff's Department, they have a little bit different system, but they, I believe, are up over $50,000 in transit costs. Um, also, probably four years ago, uh, this prescribing psychologist came forward and uh, at that time, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Sandy Pash, who is a psychiatric nurse, uh, it's my understanding had put forth uh, some legislation kind of in favor of this, but then uh, before it got too far along, she went ahead and pulled it back. And my source on this is Mr. Andrew Sperling, who is currently the Federal uh, Director of Advocacy for NAMI National. So just, uh, as a comment, uh, I would also like to encourage all the members of the board, we really need your support for the human services budget. We really appreciate that support uh, in the past and we look forward to continued support in the future. And I know it's not gonna get any easier. And the need for mental health treatment is getting larger. And so we need to look at that. We need to look at the simple things like Bridges Community Center, which let's have it open on Saturday. Right now it's just Monday through Friday. You get a huge return for the buck on Bridges Community Center. It's things like this. It's the, uh, we need to keep supporting the care center. Our 11 bed facility here that many times can keep a person here in transition in Kenosha. I mean, it doesn't replace a locked facility, but it has done a, a, a tremendous job for our community. I'd also like to uh, follow up. We have $197,000 that I will continue to pursue with the Math Martha Hollowell grant. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jack. Any other citizens to speak? Please state your name and address for the record, and you'll have five minutes to speak. Good evening, my name is uh, Barb DeBerg, and I uh, come before you as a member of CUSH, which is a nonpartisan interfaith coalition actively living our faith and our values in pursuit of justice through advocacy, education, and empowerment. And I'm here tonight to announce to the board and to Kenosha at large that CUSH is, um, invites members of the public, law enforcement, to come together this Thursday, July 21st at 7 o'clock for a community march for peace and healing. The march will begin on the east side of the lawn of the Kenosha Public Museum. We will march to the lakefront where community and faith leaders will lead a lantern release if the DNR approves it. We don't know yet. Um, representing the officers and the people of color who have died in the recent events. This event marks a starting point for CUSH to foster dialogue and action that leads to equality, justice, peace, 
and healing for our whole community. So please join us on Thursday at the Kenosha Public Museum. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Barb. Any other citizens? Please state your name and address for the record. Annette Flynn, 7945 18th Avenue. I'm here again to ask the same questions that I've asked two times and once last Monday uh, regarding our contract with Kemper Center. Um, wondering if it is a current valid contract. Gary Granke states that no caterer has a contract with Kemper Center. Um, if it is valid, the commissions that um, we paid for, I'm sorry, for, uh, for contracts that we had in the past, we've collected commissions. That money has gone to Kemper Center. And if we are indeed, uh, enti I'm sorry, if it's valid, then I need to know what to charge my customers. And if it is invalid, I need to know when we can expect a refund from Kemper Center on the commissions that we collected for the last parties that we have done. Maybe Mr. Ron Frederick, you could look into that for me. We've asked you a couple times. Um, I look forward to your report, Mr. Uh, Elverman. I'm hoping that you will report on that tonight. Maybe we can get somewhere with this. I've got an event coming up on August 6th, and I need to final bill my customer, and I don't know what to charge them. So thank you. Thank you, Annette. <clears throat> Any other citizens to speak? Any citizens to speak? Seeing no other citizens, I'm going to close citizen comments. We'll move on. I have a couple of announcements. First, I'd like to welcome our two youth and governance who are here tonight, Andrew Coralie from the Finance and Administration Committee and Alexandra Hara from the Legislative Committee. Welcome. A um, couple of announcements. Um, we are going to have a Committee of the Whole on Tuesday, September 6th at 6.15. Um, we're going to have the Deputy District Attorney Mike Gravely come in and do his heroin presentation. I know that he has already done this for the uh, Human Services Committee, but I think it's important for the rest of the, the board to hear this. It's a very powerful uh, presentation that he has, and um, I think going into the budget cycle, it's something that everyone needs to hear. And we will move on with supervisor reports. Supervisor Elverman, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The um, <clears throat> Facilities Committee, Highways, Parks, Golf, uh, <coughs> met, I believe, last Monday. Uh, even after the wet, damp, and bad weekend spring, the, the Golf Department has caught up and is actually ahead of last year. And those of you that are watering your lawns right now probably know why. It hasn't rained. So we haven't lost weekends now in the last month. Um, the uh, leagues are playing. People are staying there. Nights are good. So golf is doing very well. Highway department is very busy. Uh, the gentleman from the Counties Association can attest that the state is actually um, hiring out a whole lot more. I mean, they keep giving us new orders for business. Uh, the townships and the villages that we serve are also keeping us very busy. So we're actually behind on our own paving because we've been doing things for the town of Wheatland, for the state. Um, but uh, Mr. Sips has been very aggressive, uh, you know, telling his people, you know, we're going to take this work because it is uh, money coming into our budget. Uh, we actually have had our people uh, tentatively uh, maybe coming back to work Fridays. Right now they've been working, you know, four tens, but we have a whole lot of work for the highway department. Um, Country Thunder, that's this week. That's the, the biggest event in Kenosha County now. And uh, highway department's been out there with signs, the, uh, all the businesses and vendors. I drove by there today. It's, it's an amazing sight now compared to what it used to be. The, um, uh, all our projects, building projects are doing well, Kemper is on schedule. Um, we've had a couple little things with soil things, but everything has been within our budget. Uh, we did uh, have Mr. Gary Gronke from Kemper at our meeting, and my first question to, to Mr. Gronke, and the, the committee was there, I don't know what everybody else took from the, that meeting, but was it, is, is any caterer treated different at Kemper Center? And he looked at us and said, absolutely not. He went through the three people that are, that are named when people are asked, and sophisticated is one of them. 
The rest of the caterers, he said, anyone that has a catering license and insurance can cater at Kemper Center. Uh, they all pay a fee to Kemper Center. They pay by the plate. Uh, he has even had a uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken cater there for a wedding. Mm -hmm. the, uh, they have a caterer's license, and they uh, did the... Uh, I was surprised, but they did it. So what everybody has to take from this is we don't run Kemper Center. We own Kemper Center. Uh, and everybody from this county board votes on their budget in the fall here. Uh, all our money that we give to Kemper Center goes to maintaining the building that we own. We maintain the grounds. It's a quality of life issue for Kenosha County. It's, it's wonderful for the residents. We want to maintain the building and the grounds because we own it. It's like any landlord. So, uh, again, we don't do the day-to-day -day and we don't want to. You ask the county executive, we have enough employees. We don't want to run another business. And um, I think it brings value to the county residents. I think Mr. Gronke answered our questions at the committee level. I have seen some correspondence between uh, sophisticating, sophisticating attorneys and Kemper's attorneys um, that have asked where do you where you want to go with this. But I've also seen the correspondence that said any events you have will honor. So. I think a, a, as a committee, um, at this point, we're, we're definitely satisfied with Mr. Gronke's answers. Um, I didn't hear any other questions from the committee. That's why I'm saying that that evening. So uh, again, we're the, uh, the owner of the building. We do not run that business. And we cannot delve into personnel or day-to-day -day activities there. So that's what I took from it. Anybody else from the committee got something else out of that meeting? You know, they're certainly free to speak. That's the end of my report. Thank you, Supervisor Overman. Seeing no other committee reports, I am going to ask that all supervisors that are sitting on committees or boards, um, they need to start giving presentations. Uh, I know that we have some supervisors that have been sitting on a board or a committee that is not a direct committee of the county board, uh, but we need to hear those presentations also. I know that Pringle Nature Center, I used to do one for them all the time, Sewer Pack, um, the uh, Brookside Board of Trustees, we need to have all of, those, all of those reports brought in. So as you start getting them, please bring them and present them to the board. Moving on. Clerk. County Executive Appointments, Christopher Brown to serve on the Kenosha County Zoning Board of Adjustments. Refer to Planning Development Extension Education Committee. Matthew Collins to serve as the Director of the Kenosha County Division of Parks. Refer to Public Works. Michael Tarasek to serve on the Kenosha County Local Emergency Planning Committee. Refer to Judiciary and Law. Resolution. 15 from the Legislative and Human Service Committee, a resolution calling on the Wisconsin State Legislator to pass legislation authorizing psychologists with special training to prescribe medication. Legislative Committee, Boyd Frederick, yes. Hallman, yes. Skalitsky, yes. Poole, yes. Franco, yes. Berg, yes. Decker, excused. Human Service, Mike Gable, yes. Hallman, abstain. Poole, yes. Blau, yes. Berg, yes. Dodge, yes. Rutzloff, yes. Supervisor Boyd Frederick. Move ordinance 15. I have a first by Supervisor Boyd Frederick and a separate second by Supervisor Gable. Supervisor Boyd Frederick, you have the floor. As we've seen already with the presentation that mental health services in this community need some assistance and Supervisor Rose's resolution here looks into one of those situations when it comes to prescribing medications. It, what this resolution will eventually do is ask the legislature to look into giving the people more training. That way they can prescribe medications to more of their clients. Thank you, Supervisor Frederick. Supervisor Elverman, you have the floor. I didn't push my... Okay. Supervisor Rhodes, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Uh, if you recall, we asked for and received a report on the mental health issue in Kenosha County. 
It contained a number of recommendations and this resolution embodies one of those resolutions. The reason for the report and the request of this board was our concern with the ever increasing costs. If you look at our resolution here starting in 2013 of uh, about a million dollars, just short of a million dollars, and then 14, um, almost 1.3 million dollars, and then two th uh, in 2015 were nearly 2.7 million dollars. This is a problem that we cannot overlook and must address. It's a cost issue that if it becomes out of hand, uh, we'll be looking at five million dollars very soon in the future. And merely to say we should have more psychiatrists in this community is really not addressing the issue. Uh, there are, there is a shortage of psychiatrists. But stop to think about it. We have no psychiatric ward at either hospital in Kenosha. What psychiatrist is going to uh, begin no psychiatric facility. There are going to be some few, and we do have some psychiatrists here who maintain an office practice, and some of them are willing to go to Racine. Some of them practice part-time here as well as elsewhere. But that shortage of psychiatrists really isn't going to be addressed until we have a psychiatric ward. We can't just sit back and do nothing and hope that it all works out in the future and pay an ever-increasing bill. And one way that the report addressed, and I think it's a very simple way, and a very sound way, is if the legislature authorized psychologists who have doctorates, not as, no, they're not medical doctorates, but they are doctorates in psychology, who are specially trained to administer this type of medication, address that problem. This is not a unique situation. There are other states that do it. And uh, I'm urging this board to urge our legislat legislators to uh, present such legislation for passage in the Wisconsin legislature. We just can't continue to pay an ever-increasing bill at the state institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Supervisor Wambolt, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I respect everyone's opinion on this matter. Um, for me, it comes down to cost versus safety. I tend to uh, err on the side of safety. And I will say I am a member or a board member of NAMI, uh, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, and as a group, NAMI does not support this. You all heard Jack Rose speak earlier and he brought up some valid points, including nurse practitioners. I would like to see an alternative to maybe what's in the resolution. Um, because there's a big difference in training um, and educational background between psychologists and psychiatrists. Even with the extra uh, proposed training a psychologist will receive, it doesn't even come close to the knowledge of a medical doctor who is the psychiatrist. So the difference between the two is a psychologist is not a medical doctor. They normally have an undergraduate degree plus a doctorate in psychology. Um, they're not trained in medicine and they mainly focus on psychotherapy for treating emotional and mental suffering in their patients and they do it with intervention and not medicine. Whereas a psychiatrist, on the other hand, is a medical doctor who has about eight years of post-undergraduate study, four years to compete or complete the MD degree plus another four years of residency. Um, because psychiatrists are trained medical doctors, they can prescribe the medications that a psychologist just cannot do at this time. And they spend much of their time with patients on med uh, medication management that a psychologist does not do um, during the course of their treatment. So remember too also that many patients are prescribed more than one medication, often several. So it's very important that the doctor understands how they all interact with each other. My understanding is the proposed education for these psychologists is basically another year. That doesn't seem like a lot to me. I would like to see other options available including like uh, Mr. Jack Rowe said, uh, nurse practitioners. So there's a big difference between the two as I see it when prescribing uh, psychotropic medications. And psychotropic medications are those drugs that affect the mind. Being misdiagnosed, these medications can be a very big deal and very dangerous. So sometimes it may be better to not be diagnosed 
been diagnosed incorrectly and treated with the wrong medication from a safety standpoint. So for, mainly for these safety reasons, I will not be supporting this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Wambolt. Supervisor Hallman, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I concur in principle with uh, our new member who just spoke prior to myself. Um, I do want to clear up exactly why the vote totals by my name look a bit unusual. Um, it was not made aware to me that uh, Mr. Jack Rose had some concerns about this resolution until it came forward to the Human Services Committee. So when I voted in legislation, I was not aware of any pending objections from anyone. Uh, that being said, procedurally, when we took the vote, I probably should have asked to sort of table it and come back to it later. But of course, we were already in progress, and so it seemed to me that abstaining made the most sense at the time. I realize it looks strange, but that is certainly the explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hallman. Supervisor Gentz, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. <clears throat> um, I would just like somebody uh, through the chair to clarify to me whether or not um, psychologists are, are doling out meds in other areas at this point. I mean, I think Supervisor Rose brought it up, but I do have some concerns uh, with what Supervisor Wambolt brought up and, and Jack Rose uh, bringing it up as, as well. Um, I'm not quite comfortable with throwing medication at a problem. I understand there's a problem there, but I don't, I don't know that this is, this is the right way to do it. And I, didn't, I wasn't at the committee meeting. I apologize. So I, I'm not clear on this. If, if somebody through the chair could, could respond to that for me, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Supervisor Rose. Uh, I believe there are four other states that uh, allow this. That's it? I, th I think that answers his question, <laughs> and, uh, what other states do. And uh, uh, there are four other states well, where uh, psychologists are licensed with special training to administer medication. Okay. Well, I, I guess I'm going to vote no on this because I'm not comfortable with that. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gens. Supervisor Gable, you have the floor. I voted for this in committee because I thought it should be discussed on the floor, and that was before Jack Rose. I knew he was coming to this meeting. I cannot support this because a year of training does not give somebody the right to monitor drugs. I mean, doctors spend years in college. They see what drugs do. You, train a psychologist for a year and he's not, he has no idea what he's looking for. So NAMI's against this, so I will be against it. Thank you, Supervisor Gable. Supervisor Sklitsky, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I'd like to commend Supervisor Rose for at least taking some action for, for an obvious problem that we have in our community and bringing something forth that at least got some attention and some debate discussion going on. And I also want to commend uh, Mr. Rose to come in and give us another alternative perhaps that we hadn't considered. One of my concerns in, in uh, committee, I also supported this resolution because I wanted it to come to the floor also, uh, was the fact that prescribing medicines uh, is already a problem in society right now with pharmaceuticals and prescription drugs. And not having the proper training and expertise, uh, especially with interactions, may create even a bigger problem. But at least it's gotten this body to discuss this issue, which is a positive. I think based on the debate I'm hearing tonight, I think some further research or at least some further discussion or some alternatives can be brought, brought forth to this body before we make a decision. Um, and I just wanted to uh, put forth the, uh, my, my thanks to both those gentlemen for at least bringing us forward. I'm not going to support this resolution tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Sklitsky. Supervisor Grady, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I fully understand the logic behind this. I think it's expedient. It's a cost-saving attempt. However, from my perspective, when I see patients every day that come into my office and they have extensive medication lists, I cannot help but suspect and I'm concerned about the fact that they are over-medicated even as, quote unquote, normal people without mental problems. So when we talk about a situation like this where, again, I think it's well-intentioned, the idea of having more drugs 
in the treatment of those who have issues, I really have my reservations, and so I would not support this. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Grady. Supervisor Boyd Frederick, you have the floor. Yeah, I would like to thank Mr. Rose for coming in because the perspective he gave during citizens' comments was not available when the Legislative Committee took this up over a couple weeks ago. And it gives us more thought of different options that might be available to us in the future of looking at this situation. Thank you, Supervisor Boyd Frederick. Supervisor Blau, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I concur with what appears to be the majority here. I, too, voted in favor of the resolution, but now I will not be voting on it simply because I did not receive the information that was given to us by Mr. Rose. Um, that said, uh, given that information, I will not be supporting this. Thank you, Supervisor Blau. Supervisor Hallman, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, certainly, as this is currently worded, I'm not in favor of it, but I want to make a suggestion. It's not a motion, but it's a, it's a suggestion. Um, rather than voting this down tonight, which it sounds like that may happen, it might actually be wiser to send it back to committee um, with this caveat that the uh, folks who are the dean or head up the UW-Madison School of Psychology um, we have some sort of conference call with them to better sift out what some other options might be. Um, I say that knowing that I have a number of friends that have been diagnosed with a variety of issues. Even as simple as something like weight loss can make it a necessary situation for one to go in and see their psychiatrist and have their meds adjusted, um, regardless as to whether or not a person is taking anything else or not. Um, so it may be wise to do that. If that sounds good, then certainly someone can make the motion and we can move forward on that. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Holman. Supervisor Gens, you have the floor. I make a motion to send this back to Human Services Committee for further discussion. Who did the second? Second. I have a first by Supervisor Gens and a second by Supervisor O'Day. All in favor? Aye. Oh. Supervisor Rose. All right, I, I have no objection to this going back to committee. And uh, this certainly is not the only solution here, and it's a, a part of a larger problem. But I don't want this report that we have authorized uh, to be ignored or the issue forgotten, and that's what I'm afraid would happen if we don't come up with some specific solutions. Take a look at that jump from 2014 to 2015. That's over 100%. Uh, that's almost 100% uh, increase here. We can ill afford that year after year, and we can talk about uh, uh, erring on the side of uh, safety, but we also have to be sensible and take a look at our costs as well, which can get out of hand. And when I see costs rising from 1.3 million in 2014 to almost 2.7 million in 2015, and looking at the kind of budget pressures that we see in year after year, uh, we can ill afford to ignore this issue. So I, I support this going back to committee, but I hope the committee brings forth some constructive cost-saving resolutions other than to say, we're going to do it as we have done in the past, because that is unacceptable. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Any other discussion on referring it back to committee? OK, seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? OK, take it back up in committee, please. New business ordinance first reading two required. Seven from the Planning Development Extension Education Committee and ordinance regarding proposed amendments to Chapter 12 Kenosha County General Zoning and Shoreland Floodplain Zoning Ordinance amending language relative to existing non-conforming structures. Resolution 24 from the Finance and Administration Committee, a resolution authorizing and providing for the issuance of not to exceed 14,100,000 general obligation promissory notes, providing for the notification and sale of said notes and other related details. Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Kubicki, yes. Rutzloff, yes. Esposito, 
Excused, Gencias Dajias. Supervisor Rose. I would uh, move resolution number 24. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Ron Frederick. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. All right, thank you. The, this is the uh, bonding resolution which will authorize the sale uh, of these uh, notes which will finance the capital budget that we authorized in the last budget uh, in November for this year. Uh, these are all standard uh, things that we previously debated and have been included in the budget. Uh, we are going to uh, the bonding rating agencies next week uh, to urge uh, a good bonding uh, uh, authorization or a rating for these bonds. And so we're, uh, and then we will accept whatever bids uh, may come and that will come before the board at uh, a meeting very in the very near future. So um, unless you have some questions, uh, I think we've debated all of these projects in the past and I won't go over them again. I, with the committee unanimously endorsed the resolution. We urge your endorsement this evening. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Any discussion on the bonding? Seeing none, this is a two-thirds vote. Oh, no, no, okay, majority vote. All those in favor? Roll call. <laughs> Motion passes. Resolution 25 from the Finance and Administration Committee, a resolution regarding the 2017 Kenosha County Budget Advisory Levy Objective. Rose, yes. Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Kabicki, yes. Retzloff, yes. Esposito, excused. Dodge, yes. Gens, yes. Supervisor Rose. Move resolution number 25. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Gens. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. All right, thank you. This is a resolution that has come before this board. Uh, since about 2007. It was originally authored by uh, Supervisor Joe Clark and myself. And, and the, the reason for it then is the same reason now. It's a sense of this board that we are urging the uh, county executive in putting his budget together to uh, have a tax levy increase that not exceed a per particular uh, percentage increase. This particular budget says, uh, this particular resolution says 2.87%. Uh, this resolution in the past has ranged from uh, 2 to 3%, and it has been a real restraint on s spending. I think this has been the most significant restraint on spending that I have seen uh, in this county board because in prior administrations, prior to this administration, we have seen budget increases of 5%, 6%, levy increases of 7 and 8% as well. And that was the original intent of this resolution when it was originally authored, to give to the executive a guideline, a sense of this board in what direction we are seeking the uh, budget for 2017. It's advisory, the executive doesn't have to follow it, but uh, the executive has followed it in the past or has done better uh, than we have uh, urged in this resolution. So we urge your support this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Supervisor Skalitsky, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'm actually a big supporter of this particular resolution in theory and uh, voted to keep it around when there was uh, the motion to, to eliminate this recommendation. However, I find it disappointing to come out of the committee that the recommendation matches the estimated increase. It doesn't challenge the administration to cut spending anymore. It simply agrees with it. And the constant referral to many years in the past when budgets were increased 5, 10, 15 percent is irrelevant to today's realities. Although I support the resolution's 
purpose, I do not uh, support the percentage that's stated in here and will not support it tonight. I think we should be challenging, challenging the administration to find new ways to be more efficient with the taxpayers' money and actually return some money on occasion to the taxpayers and not just simply say, well, look at how low we keep the increase. That's not being responsible to our constituents, and I will not support it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Sklitsky. Supervisor Grady, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support this resolution for a number of reasons. Uh, first is from a very practical standpoint of having the administration know that we as County Board Supervisors take a responsible approach to probably our number one job, which is budget and finance. And this is one way of doing it. Um, we can parse numbers, 2.7 is too much, it's too little. Um, that can always come out in the actual presentation by each department. We go through line by line, budget time in November, and we vote upon specific departmental budgets. So if you have a bone to pick, you think this spends too much, you can take it up at that time. But the point of the matter is to look at it as a larger project. We are a growing county. We are not a county here that's going backwards, that is contracting, where we're building less roads and we have less human services. Witness just what's all around you, reading the papers. This is a county that's on the move, we're on the way up. Do you want your infrastructure to keep pace? Do you want to have this be an attractive, beneficial place to live? You know, a 2%, 2.75, 2.87% increase is not excessive. It's well within our jurisdiction as a recommendary entity. So I encourage your approval and thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Grady. Seeing no other lights, roll call has been requested. Mr. Passes, right? Motion passes. Resolution 26 from the Finance and Administration Committee and the Brookside Board of Trustees, a resolution regarding the Kolick Schneider Memorial Fund established for Brookside Care Center. Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Gens, yes. Kubicki, yes. Retzloff, yes. Esposito, excused. Dodge, yes. Supervisor Rose. I would move the resolution. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Kubicki. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Uh, Brookside Care Center established a number of years ago a, uh, uh, a fund with some contributions received from some uh, estates which are mentioned in the resolution. That has been used for things which are not budgeted in the uh, Brookside budget. Uh, the, the difference between the way we are doing it now with the administration of that fund solely by the county uh, through Brookside Care Center is that uh, it would now be administered through the community uh, foundation. And uh, they would be able to invest that money in mutual funds, uh, in pooled funds, uh, and the county is not authorized to do that. Uh, so the, if we, they looked at the percentage increases that the community foundation had, and it was projected that we probably would be able to have at least 5% after payment of expenses uh, increases every year. Right now with increases, uh, in the, the, or the rates of interest on various uh, savings accounts, CDs, uh, bonds, uh, we can't achieve that. So the amount of interest that is being generated currently through the investment of this fund uh, through the Brooks, Brookside Board of Trustees re really leaves us very little interest. We have not dipped into the principal but are trying to use the interest and it's a negligible amount. The idea here is to have the Community Foundation do better than that, and uh, the track record for them is a good track record. 
Uh, currently, Dave Gersten, our finance director, does sit on the uh, Kenosha Community uh, Board. Thank you, Supervisor Rhodes. Supervisor Decker, you have the floor. I have a question about this handwritten wording that is barely legible. What does it say, number one, and is that part of the actual resolution that was passed? Uh, it is part of the resolution. Uh, the, ultimately, the Brookside Board will decide what should be done uh, with the money that is generated by the Community Foundation. Okay, what does this say? I cannot read it. Okay. <laughs> Dave's here, he wrote <laughs> Mr. Geertsen, can you please oh, tell me I'm what it says? <laughs> it's the naming of the fund and only. It's to be called the Brookside Kulik Schindler Brutelli Endowment Fund. Schneider. Yes. Well, what was that? Schneider. Kulik yeah, Schneider. Yeah, so you can't read Brutelli. it either, <laughs> Mr. Geertsen, Mr. Geertsen can you please? Mr. Geertsen, could you please repeat that? It's, uh, it says, be it further yeah. resolved, yeah. the... The committee directed that the fund at the Community Foundation be named after the wonderful benefactors that provided the money. And historically, it was Max, Schneider, or Max Kulik Schneider and then Mr. Bertelli. So we're going to uh, direct that the fund have those names. So that's what that language says. So. <laughs> Thank you. And is that something we can do as a board? Yes. The, the Even foundation though it's going would, Yes. The foundation would love to have our input on how to name the fund. They would love to have that. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else, Supervisor Decker? Okay. Supervisor Gens, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I just, we did have a, a lot of discussion on this and we wanted to make sure that the people who actually donated the money stayed recognized and we didn't dip into the principal um, at this time. So uh, there was a lot of debate over wh who would have final say on this and it came down to the Brookside Board of Trustees still having oversight on these funds. So that's what swayed me to support it. I just wanted to share that with the board. So the, the Board of Trustees still has oversight on, on what happens with this interest and the money that these people donated. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gens. Supervisor Rose, did you have anything else? Uh, no. Okay. Seeing no other lights, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 27 from the Human Service Committee, a resolution to approve the appointment of Lauren Fox to the Kenosha County Board of Administrative Appeals. Gable, yes. Hallman, yes. Berg, yes. Blau, yes. Dodge, yes. Poole, yes. Retzloff, yes. Supervisor Gable. I'd like, Madam Chairman, I'd like to move uh, Resolution 27. I have a first by Supervisor Gable and a second by Supervisor Hallman. Supervisor <coughs> Gable. Uh, this is an appointment that uh, Administration Appeal Board. She was in an unanimous vote on the committee. I see no reason why not to vote for her. Thank you, Supervisor Gable. Any questions on the appointment? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 28 from the Human Service Committee, a resolution to approve the appointment of Brooke Infacino to the Kenosha County Workforce Development Board. Gable, yes. Hallman, yes. Berg, yes. Blau, yes. Dodge, yes. Poole, yes. Retzloff, yes. Supervisor Gable. I'd like to move Resolution 28. I have a first by Supervisor Gable and a second by Supervisor Berg. Supervisor Gable. I believe Brooke and Fazina right now is on the board and it's just a reappointment. Oh. Any questions on the appointment? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 29 from the Human Service Committee, a resolution to approve the appointment of Paul Heglin to the Kenosha County Workforce Development Board. Gable, yes. Hallman, yes. Berg, yes. Blau, yes. Dodge, yes. Poole, yes. Retzloff, yes. Supervisor Gable. I'd like to move Resolution 29. 
have a first by Supervisor Gable and a second by Supervisor Blau. Supervisor Gable. Again, this is a reappointment to the board. Any questions on the reappointment? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 30 from Judiciary and Law Committee, Finance and Administration Committee, a resolution to approve the successor labor agreement between the County of Kenosha and the Kenosha County Deputy Sheriff's Association. Judiciary and Law, Blau, yes. Boyd Frederick, yes. Retzloff, no. Skalitsky, no. Wambolt, yes. Finance and Administration, Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Kabicki, excused. Retzlo Retzloff, abstained. Esposito, yes. Dodge, yes. Gens, yes. Supervisor Rose. All right, thank you. Uh, move the uh, resolution number 30. I have a first by Supervisor Rose and a second by Supervisor Blau. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. All right, thank you. The highlight of the, the agreement is that it's a three-year contract negotiated with the Deputy Sheriff's Association. The uh, first year, 2017, calls for a 2% increase beginning July 9th of 2017. The second 2% increase in 2018 begins July 8th of 2018, and the third year, 2019, it's a 3% beginning June 30th of 2019. Uh, the, before the new hired deputy would receive or qualify for a $1,000 bonus in the first year, that uh, is eliminated. There are some language changes in this. Uh, one of the uh, uh, change, one of those uh, items uh, has to do with when does a probationary period begin. The new language actually extends that probationary period as it commences one year from the first day of phase one of the field training officer program. So it's a longer probationary period for new deputies. Uh, it reduces uh, from three to one, the number of casual days to be used on holidays. Uh, there are some other language changes as well, and, and those have been listed in the attached uh, document. Uh, the standard controversial uh, 621, language, 621 language has, uh, has been maintained. Uh, the sheriffs, I think that that's a Sheriff's Administration discretionary uh, management decision, uh, but it is continued to be maintained as a 621 schedule as uh, current, uh, adjusting starting times as necessary with the uh, employee union representation and cooperation. I think those are the major points. Uh, there's some other points that are listed, but I think you can read those, but I think that focuses on the big points. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Supervisor Retzloff, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you can see, I voted both. I've abstained. I voted no. Tonight, I'm going to vote yes, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, the second part of this is very disturbing to me. The first part is a little concerning, too, because in this three-year agreement, the deputy sheriffs will not contribute anything to the health insurance premium, nothing. And that's over three years. Um, in the discussion that we had, that I've had many with both personnel and our finance committee, uh, I have no understanding why that was not brought to the bargaining table. Sure, when you go back and forth, and I understand the sheriff's uh, union is very uh, diligent in these type of things and would probably understand how expensive our health insurance is getting. <sighs> If we had just gotten a 10% health contribution over three years, it would be $540,000 savings to us. That's significant money. To let that go without out pass through collective bargaining is, I don't like that. It should have been put on the table and collectively bargained. That's why I voted no on the Judicial Committee. Since that time, a few things have happened around this country that are extremely, extremely, extremely just pressing and upsetting to me, and that is the treatment of our law enforcement officers across this country. I am so upset when I see what happened in Dallas, Baton Rouge, uh, I-94 in Minneapolis, St. Paul area where I'm originally from, what happened in Baltimore where my son lives. I have never been this upset anything, either personal or business-wise, for years. Um, to think that our law enforcement people 
are treated like this, a group of people wants to kill them, is beyond my understanding. And I know that their jobs are extremely difficult, and I'm willing to live with this money that we can find somewhere else in our budget to show our support for our law enforcement people across this country. Madam Chairman, and I, I can't tell you how important this has been coming to me, and I thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Retzloff. Supervisor Sklitsky, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I also voted against this uh, primarily due to the health care contribution issue not even being brought into the table during collective bargaining. But I share many of Supervisor Retzloff's sentiments and uh, concerns over uh, many recent developments in our nation. As a result, I will be supporting this resolution. I wish all our, our law enforcement representatives and emergency individuals uh, Godspeed and may God bless them and, and look over them as they are in a very dangerous situation out there. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Skalitsky. Supervisor Decker, you have the floor. I would just like to state that I agree with Supervisor Skalitsky and Supervisor Retzloff. Um, I would have voted against it for the same reasons, but for the same reasons, I am also voting for it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Decker. Supervisor Rose, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Let me point out something because there, they have a different health plan and a more costly health plan for them. They have a $5,000 deductible on their plan and the other employees do not. And I, I think that's something that needs to be said here. Uh, and that's significant, the $5,000 deductible. And if you ask the deputies, they'll tell you it's significant. Thank you, Supervisor Rose. Seeing no other lights. Roll call has been requested. Stop doing it. We have a unanimous vote. Resolution 31 from Judiciary and Law and the Finance Administration Committee, a resolution regarding the FY 2016 Law Enforcement Justice Assistance Grant. Blau, yes. Boyd Frederick, excused. Retzloff, yes. Skalitsky, yes. Wambolt, yes. Finance Administration, Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Gens, yes. Dodge, yes. Kabicki, yes. Esposito, excused. Retzloff, yes. Supervisor Blau. I move for Resolution 31. I have a first by Supervisor Blau and a second by Supervisor Rose. Supervisor Blau, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an annual formula grant offered to the City of Kenosha, whereby the County of Kenosha is considered a spirit jurisdiction, and they share this grant by an agreement between the City and the County. The total funds offered to the City is 30574 of which 12230 uh, is going to the County and they are going to be using these funds uh, for law enforcement equipment uh, to used to be uh, purchase taser devices and accessories, and I urge your support on this. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Blau. Seeing no lights, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 32 from the Planning Development Extension Education Committee, a resolution regarding the final plat of the reserve subdivision, Stephen C. Mills, Mills Enterprises, LLC, and Greg T. and Laura M. Bong, Garden Owners, Dan Sizep, Baird Development, LLC agent, Town of Salem. Decker, yes. Poole, yes. Skalitsky, yes. Gilmore, yes. Bostrom, yes. Supervisor Decker. Move resolution 32. I have a first by Supervisor Decker and a second by Supervisor Poole. Supervisor Decker. This property is located on the north side of State Highway 50 and 83, approximately two tenths of a mile west of the intersection with 261st Avenue in the town of Salem. The rezoning would allow a final plat for an 11 lot subdivision. The Town of Salem recommended approval of the request. Thank you, Supervisor Decker. Seeing no lights, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Resolution 33 from the Public Works Facilities and the Finance and Administration Committees, a resolution regarding the Emerald Ashbore Reforestation Grant. Alverman, yes. Grady, yes. O'Day, excused. Gilmore, yes. Wambolt, yes. Bostrom, yes. Franco, yes. 
Binance Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Gens, yes. Kabicki, yes. Ratzloff, yes. Esposito excused. Dodge, yes. Supervisor Alverman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move resolution 33. I have a first by Supervisor Alverman and a second by Supervisor Rose. Supervisor Alverman. Yes, you've all heard me reporting on the saga of the Emerald Ash Bore for the last couple of years and hundreds of thousands of dollars that we've spent. Well, Mr. Collins found a, uh, a grant here that we uh, can receive, and the matching uh, funds that we have to provide can be in kind labor. We have our workforce in place, we have our summer workforce also in place. And uh, this will, uh, $20,000 is a lot of money on raking up piles of shavings from stump grindings and I mean it's been a ongoing and it still is an ongoing project so this is great help and uh, I ask for your approval. Thank you Supervisor Alverman. Seeing no lights, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Next. Resolution 34 from Public Works Facilities and the Planning Development Extension Education and the Finance and Administration Committees, a resolution regarding the purchase of floodplain property. Elverman, yes. Grady, yes. Gilmore, yes. Wamble, yes. Bostrom, yes. O'Day, excused. Franco, yes. Finance Admin Rose, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Gens, yes. Kabicki, yes. Dodge, yes. Esposito, excused. Rutzloff, yes. Pedek, Decker, yes. Poole, yes. Glitzky, yes. Gilmore, yes. Bostrom, yes. Supervisor Alverman. Move resolution 34. I have a first by Supervisor Alverman and a second by Supervisor Decker. Supervisor Alverman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I won't call this a saga. Supervisor Gens didn't like saga when I said it, so. I, I um, thought we were watching a movie. The uh, 170 here that we've uh, done, I voted on each one of them. Uh, I remember the beginning of this. We have at times had a half a million dollars. We've had a million dollars in, in a year. Uh, I give uh, kudos to our departments for noticing these properties. And this is truly working together because the money for this one isn't in uh, the planning budget, but it came from the savings that we got from our roof project on the highway department. So uh, we get another one of those properties removed and uh, we get grass planted. We have less flooding for the uh, remaining residents of Kenosha County, so I ask for your approval. Thank you, Supervisor Overman. Seeing no lights, this is a budget modification, requires two thirds vote. Motion passes. Communications from Andy M. Bueller regarding future items scheduled before the Planning Development and Extension Education Committee. I'm being waved to one. Supervisor Gantz. I have a point of information and I think it would fit very nicely under communications. I apologize for when I made the motion to send something back to committee. I think when we do that, we should ask the chair of the committee when the next committee meeting is so that we're all aware of that if we're going to refer it back to committee for those who might have questions on it. So is the next human services meeting the first Tuesday before the county board meeting? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Gens. Super Clerk. <laughs> Claims Brian Roselle destroyed property. Refer to Corporation Council. Robert Solberg, vehicle damage. Refer to Corporation Council. Time Warner Cable Phoenix lost control, damage to property. Refer to Corporation Council. Barry Barr, vehicle damage. Refer to Corporation Council. Approval of the June 21st, 2016 minutes by Supervisor Boyd Frederick. Supervisor Motion to approve the Frederick. June 21st. I have a first by Supervisor Boyd Frederick and a second by Supervisor Gable. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. And, and I have a, a first by first. Supervisor Dodge to adjourn, second by Supervisor Gable. All those in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you.